Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, begin this morning's session. Thank you so much for coming in person. Thank you so much for being here on, uh, for all those who are out there on the, on the webinar. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm Rob Driscoll. I am a shareholder in Reinhardt's Labor and Employment Practice. And uh, I am co-presenting today with Katie Triska, who is also a shareholder in the Labor and Employment Practice. And we're going to be speaking to you about uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, obviously, a hot topic in uh, national news with recent changes in the overtime, uh, the exemption rules for overtime, uh, which we will discuss later in the presentation. But it does cover um, a wide, our presentation does cover a wide variety of topics. Um, for those of you who are at least generally familiar with wage and hour law, you know it's a very varied and complex area, a lot of regulations, a lot of laws. Um, so what we're going to be giving is really just an overview of some of the bigger topics, the bigger issues that come up um, more frequently or that you see more cases over or more disputes over um, as a method of issue spotting, uh, as a method of uh, deciding whether practices that you're doing are compliant with wage and hour law. And, uh, and so one of the big questions that comes up is why is this an important topic? You know, one of the areas, one of the issues is many times violations really don't result in too large of damages. Uh, if you have an hourly employee who's making 10 or $15 per hour, that's not a lot if you're talking about missing an hour here or there. Well, I think one chart can kind of sum up why this is such a big deal in today's world. And, and that's right here. FLSA suits filed in federal court. As you can see, going back to 2001, there's been just an astronomical increase in these types of suits in federal court. And it's a pretty clear trend line. You know, there was an increase starting back in 01, uh, pretty steady. In 2007, it exploded. Why? Well, the Great Recession, most likely, as people lose their jobs, are more likely to file a lawsuit seeking compensation of some kind or another. Um, it dropped off a little bit in 2008, but still historically high. And the trend has been up, mostly, uh, since then. And right now, for 2016, the fiscal year 2016, we're on pace to have over 9,000 of these lawsuits filed in federal court alone. And that's an important point because this is only federal court. This is not state court. So there could be, there's more in each in the state. This is not state agencies. There's more of these claims being filed in the state agencies. It's not even the federal Department of Labor. Um, many of those cases that the Department of Labor investigates are resolved well before they get to federal court. I think the numbers is only only 2% of these cases in federal court are actually filed by the Department of Labor on behalf of individuals. The rest are private lawsuits brought by uh, private individuals uh, representing themselves or trying to represent others in a class action. And so you can see some more numbers that highlight, that illustrate why this is such an important topic uh, for employers. FLSA suits in federal courts have quadrupled since the year 2000. Um, in, in 1991, they made up 1% of all federal cases. Um, today, 3.1% of all federal cases. So they're really the fastest type, uh, the fastest growing type of wage and hour, or excuse me, of employment litigation in the courts. Um, it, it, again, as I mentioned before, we're expected to pass 9,000 cases filed in 2016. Now the flip side of this, as I mentioned earlier, is that the Department of Labor has its own investigatory process for wage and hour violations. And it's, it was, starting in 2009 with the Obama administration, a priority uh, for them to instigate their own investigation. Now the Department of Labor has two ways where it starts an investigation. One, it receives a complaint from a person. So a private individual, maybe instead of filing a lawsuit, actually goes to the Department of Labor, complains, Department of Labor investigates. Uh, but they can also um, start an investigation on their own um, with their own priorities. They may target a particular industry or if they have a particular employer that they know has had labor and employment or labor violation, wage violations in the past, they might every couple years check in on them. And they have pretty plenary authority to go in and review time cards, record, records that are kept um, toward, toward plants, um, pretty much do, fortunately, whatever they want with regard to wage and hour. And that, that's become a priority. And you can see that in the numbers here. In fiscal year 2015, the Department of Labor recovered $246 million in back wages on behalf of 240,000 workers. Um, and importantly, they found violations in 79% of all 
agency-initiated investigations, which is phenomenally high. And that kind of highlights why these cases in general are becoming so prevalent. The regulations are highly complex, and it's very easy to have technical violations without you even knowing it. Um, and, and so when, when people say, well, what's the big deal? Why, why are these, why do we need to defend against these types of cases when maybe the amount of money is so small? Even the numbers you see, $246 million spread over 240,000 workers, really isn't that much. Well, one thing that this doesn't show is kind of the multiple, multiplying effect of private litigation in court. And we'll take, just focus on federal court. So maybe you have an employee who's only ho owed um, $1,000 from a violation. Well, federal law says that they get double damages pretty much automatically. Very few situations in which you can you know, uh, avoid those double damages, 100%. So they're up to 2,000 already. Um, maybe that $1,000 was only over a year. Well, the statute of limitations under FLSA is two years. So maybe it's $2,000. And if they can prove that the violation in question was willful, that the employer knew or should have known about it but did nothing, then actually the statute of limitations goes back to three years. So you might be at $3,000, double to $6,000 just for one, one person. And of course, the big thing is class actions. If that violation was pursuant to a policy that uh, affected others within the organization, they're all going to have their own claims as well. And so wage and hour class actions are probably the most common type of private lawsuit that you're going to see. So if you have 100 people who are owed $6,000, all of a sudden you're up to $600,000. Um, so you can see how it multiplies. And there's one last factor, um, and that's attorney's fees. The statute provides for attorney's fees whenever the plaintiff can prove any sort of violation of wage and hour law. Um, and importantly, it's not uh, proportional to the amount that's actually recovered. So let's say you only have a single violation and it's only $6,000. That's all you're dealing with. Still not, not a lot of money. But attorney's fees aren't tied to that. So if you fight it, if the employer fights this and loses, attorney's fees can run into hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not just your own, but paying for the plaintiff's fees. There is an example out of uh, Georgia, Georgia Federal Court, just three years ago where the underlying violation resulted in back pay to the employee of $6,000. Um, attorney's fees that were awarded in that case uh, ran to $170,000, uh, you know, what, 30 times the amount of the underlying claim. So employers can argue until they're blue in the face that it doesn't make any economic sense whatsoever for a plaintiff to bring a, a case that costs $170,000 to recover $6,000 in a claim. That's fine, but courts, by and large, do not accept that reasoning. Um, and there's nothing really, there's no signs that, that, that that's going to change absent some sort of legislative fix. Um, so you, again, you can see why these types of claims um, are so easy, are so attractive for plaintiff's attorneys to bring. Uh, they're typically very discrete issues. Um, it's not a ton of facts. Frankly, it doesn't require a ton of depositions, a ton of document discovery, and they're very lucrative. You have um, uh, guaranteed attorney's fees if they can prove a violation, and even if they can't, it's a, it's a hammer to hold over the employer's head to force um, a settlement. And of course, the class action only adds on to that because instead of talking about one, you're talking about 100 or 200 or, or 1,000, whatever the case um, may be. And, and so what you're seeing a lot is employees who lose their job or are disgruntled for some reason, they go to talk to an attorney about maybe a discrimination claim. Um, and it's very easy for that plaintiff's counsel to say, <clears throat> well, tell me how you were paid. You know, what, what, what were you paid correctly for meal breaks? How, how did that work? Did you get 30 minutes? Um, oh, they classified you as exempt from overtime. Well, what were your job duties? And so that's very easy to either tack on to a discrimination claim or to bring as a standalone claim if the attorney doesn't think that that discrimination claim um, is going to be a, a viable one for them. Um, so what we're going to talk about today are then some of the big issues that employers need to be aware of to help avoid litigation or prepare for wage and hour investigations so you're in the best situation uh, to be able to defend yourself, um, either get the case dismissed or get a quick settlement, a favorable settlement, or to prove to the Department of Labor that you really haven't done anything wrong. So I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to Katie who will uh, talk about worker classifications.
Thanks, Rob. Um, one additional comment I might add on to all the other points you made is we're seeing this right here in Milwaukee. Um, there are law firms in town that have attorneys devoted to doing nothing other than pursuing these wage claims. Um, so it, this, you know, while this trend is certainly occurring at a national level, level we're also seeing it locally. So to start, I'm going to cover three different types of worker classifications um, <clears throat> that come up frequently uh, where employers have misclassified the workers either as independent contractors, as unpaid interns, or as um, volunteers. In order to be correctly classified as an independent contractor, the Department of Labor applies an economic realities test, and it considers these six factors. Um, what is the employer's control over the work to be performed? If the employer has a lot of control over this work, that would suggest that the individual is an employee. What is the opportunity for profit and loss? If it appears that the worker could only realize a profit and could never experience a loss, that too would suggest that the worker is an employee. What is the extent of the worker's investment in equipment and materials? If the worker hasn't invested anything in um, terms of equipment and materials, for example, they didn't buy their own computer, then have to buy a company truck, um, that would also suggest then that they're an employee. Whether the service rendered requires a specialized skill, the permanency of the relationship, um, if it's an indefinite relationship, that would suggest that they're an employee as opposed to a contractor who's typically hired for a discrete term or a discrete project. And finally, what is the integration of service with the employer's business? Um, and a good example of this is if, for example, um, you're a manufacturing company and you're bringing in a contractor to improve your IT systems, that would suggest they're an independent contractor. It's unrelated to the employer's underlying business of manufacturing. If, however, the individual's um, working the line the same as other employees, that would suggest that they're an employee. Um, importantly, no one factor uh, is determinative. And the mere fact that you might have a contract that says this individual is an independent contractor isn't determinative either. Um, the Department of Labor would look at how the relationship actually works in practice. Employers often misclassify workers as unpaid interns as well. Um, excuse me. Nancy, can you come help for a second? Apologies. Um, when you're looking at whether a worker is a unpaid intern or if they should be a paid employee, there are six factors that must be met. Um, one, the internship is similar to the training um, the intern would receive in an education environment. The internship is for the benefit of the intern um, as opposed to for the employer. The intern doesn't replace regular employees but works under the close supervision the employer derives no immediate advantage from the activities of the intern, and instead, its operations may actually be impeded by the intern is not necessarily entitled to a job at the conclusion of the internship, and both the employer and the intern understand that the intern is not entitled to wages for the internship. And I'll give you a, um, in a law firm setting, for example, um, if you have uh, a high school student coming in for the summer, if that individual is making copies, filing documents, delivering, the individual likely should be classified as an employee because it, this, that work wouldn't satisfy these six criteria. They're performing these perform. Um, it would be difficult to say that the employer doesn't benefit from that intern, um, and that work wouldn't be the training an intern would receive in an educational environment. Um, in contrast, if you have the same student who's maybe shadowing attorneys, going to court, sitting in on meetings, um, that might be something that would be more appropriately classified as an unpaid intern. Um, 
The last category of worker classifications that I'll be discussing um, are volunteers. Without exception, employees for for-profit employers may not volunteer for the employer. Um, however, um, for nonprofit entities, um, it's possible that um, an individual could volunteer for them and not be entitled to any type of pay. So what the DOL will look at is whether there was any kind of expectation of compensation, any sort of immediate or primary benefit, whether um, the work is important to the employer's main business, um, if there was any type of coercion, and is the services provided by the volunteer similar to what would be performed by the individual as an employee. Um, here's another example. If you have a nurse at a nursing home, and on weekends she wants to come and play piano for the residents, that would be consistent with these factors that we see for this test for volunteer status, where um, you know the piano playing isn't important to the work of the main business of the nursing home, um, and it's not the same type of services that this individual performs as an employee. Um, if instead she were to come in on the weekends and be checking blood pressure, um, that again would then suggest that she should be paid for that time. So we're next going to discuss um, exempt positions versus non-exempt positions. And this is just under federal law. I'll highlight a few areas in which federal law is different than Wisconsin law. But there's two main tests that have to be met in order to be exempt under the FLSA. First is the salary test. Under this test, an employee must be paid a minimum amount of salary that's fixed and not subject to any type of deduction due to the quality of the work or the quantity of their work. The next test we refer to as the duties test. Under this test, um, we're looking to see, do their job duties primarily involve executive, administrative, professional, or other duties? And we'll go through these duties in more detail in the next slides. There are some professions that aren't subject to the, the minimum salary requirements. That would be licensed professionals, certain computer employees, and outside sales employees. So in order to satisfy the salary test, um, you can't pay exempt employees by the hour. You can't reduce their wages based on the quality or quantity of work or the number of days or hours worked each week. However, the law does allow employers to make deductions in certain circumstances. Um, these are all assuming that the deductions are for absences of one or more full days. For example, if the employee is absent for personal reasons, um, absent due to sickness or disability, if um, the employer is penalizing the employee, for example, through a suspension for violations of major safety rules. And then also included in here um, is a note that employers may offset amounts that employees receive as jury or witness fees um, from their compensation for that week. Deductions are allowed also if the individual is absent due to FMLA leave, and significantly, this doesn't have to be a full day absence, so if they're only absent for two hours, we can deduct two hours from their salary for that week. During their first and last week of employment, employers only need to pay exempt employees for their actual hours worked. And this last rule is under federal law. Wisconsin does not recognize this as a um, acceptable reason for deduction, and that's due to an unpaid disciplinary suspension for workplace conduct rules. When you're reviewing your handbooks, it's important to ensure that you have this safe harbor provision included in your policies. By having this policy, it makes it easier for you to maintain an employee's status as exempt, even if you should inadvertently make an improper pay deduction. The policy should state that um, the company prohibits improper pay deductions. Um, it should include a mechanism for employees to complain about any deductions. And the employer should be 
uh, include a statement that it's committed to reimbursing employees for improper deductions and that the employer commits to complying in the future. As many of you know, effective December 1st, there's changes to the salary test. Um, the salary level requirement for exempt administrative and professional employees will increase from 4.55 per week to 9.13 per week. Um, so roughly about $47,500 per year. This change also is going to increase the salary level requirement for highly compensated employees to $134,000 per year. Um, note under Wisconsin, there is no highly compensated employee equivalent, um, so employers should not rely on this uh, in Wisconsin. And the Department of Labor, pursuant to these changes, will be increasing the salary threshold every three years beginning January 1, 2020. One of the questions that I've received um, recently in the, past, or in the past week is whether this change is still going to go into effect and whether um, you know, the new administration might change what's planned. And as of now, this change is still going into effect. There were some attempts to block it. Um, but as of now, it's still going to go into effect, so employers should plan accordingly. And while it's possible, certainly, that under a new administration, they may make some changes to this, um, that may not happen immediately. So again, employers need to comply with this law beginning December 1st. As part of these changes, um, the Department of Labor will allow non-discretionary bonuses and certain incentive payments to count towards 10% of that minimum salary requirement. And if you're going to make this kind of um, bonus or incentive payment to get to that 47,000, you need to make sure that those payments are made at least quarterly. Um, an example of this type of payment would be like a retention bonus or commission payment. Um, but again, you, it can only be up to 10% of the, the minimum salary requirement. So I've got two examples that would show how this might work. So in the first example, we have Salary, who's an exempt employee paid on a weekly basis, and she receives a quarterly non-discretionary bonus. At a minimum, she needs to be receiving $821 per week, which is 90% of the 913. Um, she then must receive a non-discretionary bonus of at least um, $1,186.90 per quarter um, in order to meet that minimum threshold of $47,000 for the year. In the second example, we have salary who's earning a quarterly non-discretionary bonus of $2,000, um, but her employer can only count $1,186 of that towards her salary level. She still has to receive, at a minimum, $821.70 each week in salary because, again, only 10% of her um, salary can come from these non-discretionary or incentive payments. So as a result of these changes, um, if employers haven't already been analyzing their uh, wage and hour information, they need to do so immediately. Um, you'll want to identify which employees will be affected by these changes, and that's the employees who are currently classified as exempt but making less than 913 per week. Um, you'll want to consider whether you want to um, increase their salaries in order to meet the new threshold or if you're going to convert them to hourly. Um, there's no requirement that you keep classifying them as exempt. But if you're going to convert them to hourly, then you need to determine what is the appropriate hourly rate for these individuals, um, which will require you to consider how much overtime they're expected to make, um, what their workload typically consists of, and are you going to try to calculate their hourly rate in a way where they end up taking home the same amount of pay as they have in prior years. The other consideration would be morale and, and what we call ripple effects um, from changing them from exempt to non-exempt. There are some employees who take pride in being salaried and being exempt and not having to punch in. And what will be the effect in your workforce if you're now requiring employees who aren't used to, be, used to having to punch in to now have to punch in? Um, and so when you're communicating these changes to employees, it's very important that 
you do so in a way that makes it clear to them that this isn't a demotion. Um, instead, this is required by law. And if you're able to um, keep their pay in the same rate range, even though you're reclassifying them as non-exempt, I let the employees know that as well. The other recommendation I would make as part of this is if you are changing some employees from exempt to non-exempt, make sure that you provide them with copies of policies that previously didn't apply to them, but that will now as non-exempt employees. That would likely be a timekeeping policy, a policy regarding breaks or lunch periods, and overtime policies. Um, I would have them separately acknowledge that they've received these policies um, to avoid any type of um, issue in the future of them denying that uh, knowledge of the employer's expectations in these regards. I'm going to cover now the more common exemptions that we see. And again, I'm going to focus on federal law. Um, the main difference with Wisconsin law is that whereas federal law doesn't tie a specific percentage to the amount of time they must be spend performing their exempt duties, Wisconsin law um, wants to see that 80% of their time is spent performing these exempt duties. So under federal law, um, they, an exempt individual would need to be paid no less than 913 per week. Their primary duty must be the management of the enterprise um, or a department of the company. They must regularly direct the work of two or more employees, and they either have to have the authority to hire and fire employees or be able to provide suggestions and recommendations as to hiring and firing that are given weight by the employer. Another common exemption that we see is the professional exemption. With this exemption, again, they'd have to meet that minimum salary requirement of 913 per week. Their primary duty must be the performance of work that requires advanced knowledge in a field of science or learning that's um, typically acquired by a course of um, specialized intellectual instruction. Um, or with creative professionals, it would be someone where their uh, primary duty is the performance of work which requires invention, imagination, or originality. And ex an example of this would be a musician or a composer. Um, they would satisfy this creative professional exemption. The administrative exemption is a ex very common exemption that we see. Um, they also have to meet that minimum salary requirement. Their primary duty has to be the performance of office or non-manual work that's directly related to the management or business operations of either the employer or the employer's customer. The primary duty must involve the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance. Um, here's areas that the Department of Labor and courts have recognized as being directly related to management or general business operations. If you have a exempt administrative individual who's not working in one of these areas, I would really scrutinize that position um, and make sure that individual is correctly classified. And, um, one of the factors I referenced was that the individual has to exercise discretion and independent judgment. This slide, I won't read through all of these factors, but gives you some insight as to what the, part that the Department of Labor or courts want to see in terms of exercising discretion and independent judgment. If someone is merely entering data into a computer, that's not going to satisfy this requirement. Instead, they want to see that the individual has the ability um, to, you know, work independently to make decisions that might bind the company and so on. Um, and I'll give two examples of this. One, if you have a bookkeeper or secretary or clerk, um, they probably wouldn't satisfy this administrative exemption because they're typically not exercising the type of discretion and independent judgment that we see described in this slide. On the other hand, an HR manager likely would satisfy this exempt administrative ex uh, requirement because they're managing and exercising discretion over personnel decisions on a daily basis. 
Federal law recognizes that outside sales employees are exempt if their primary duty is making sales or obtaining orders or contracts for services. The employee has to, however, be regularly and customarily working away from the employer's place of business. Um, and significantly with this exemption, there's no requirement that they be paid on a salary basis. Courts recently addressed this in, in two cases. One, in one case, they recognized that the employee was exempt as an outside salesperson where she spent four to eight hours per day outside the office making sales calls. She spent 10 hours a week developing marketing plans and maintained a database of customers that formed the basis of her commission payments. In another case, um, the employee didn't make any direct sales, but she trained others on how to make sales, and the court found that she was not an exempt outside salesperson. Another exemption is this commission sales exemption. The employee has to work for a retailer service establishment. Their regular rate of pay must be at least one and a half times the minimum wage rate for all hours worked, and at least half of their compensation must be paid from commission. So two examples of this exemption. One, if you have a high rise, for, exa for example, a high rise window washer who is a commission sales employee, um, that's paid on a commission basis, um, but paid only if there's a sale of their services, um, that individual would meet this exemption. On the other hand, an employee who sells term life insurance is not an exempt commissioned employee because the sale is not for a retail or service establishment. I'm going to turn this back over to Rob, who's going to cover um, record keeping and other similar issues under the FLSA. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Katie. Um, so Katie's presentation really focused on workers that would be outside FLSA requirements to pay minimum wage and overtime. Now, you have to fall in you know, one of those buckets for exempt administrative professionals or executive professionals or you're an outside sales <clears throat> worker. And when you do that, the FLSA says, well, okay, you don't have to pay overtime to them or, you know, the minimum wage isn't going to apply to them. Well, there's, of course, a whole other set of employees who FLSA is going to apply to, who minimum wage rules do apply to, overtime does apply to. And that's what I want to focus on. Um, that's this kind of bucket of workers here is people that, you know, uh, are going to be owed overtime. So what, under what situations is that going to occur? What does it mean to, uh, to work, to be compensated, things of that nature? Minimum wage is pretty straightforward, but it's the overtime issue and the working time issue that's really important. Uh, a, a little bit of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just kind of a, a, a summary of this is the record keeping rules. And under FLSA, there's certain requirements to keep records, and you can see that they're more uh, stringent for non-exempt employees because they're owed overtime. And so there's more records that employers have to take. Now, this is only federal. State may have its own set of records, but it kind of, and I encourage you to look at the regulations, look at the statutes, but it kind of gives a, a, an idea of what, what's at stake here and what, you know, how the, the law treats employees differently. In Wisconsin, up until, I think it was just last year, about a year and a half ago, Exempt employees, you actually had to track hours for, you were required to. No one did it. Um, the, the state really didn't enforce it, and they finally got wise to it and just got rid of it. So that's the same as federal at this point. Um, but again, you still need to keep more records for non-exempt employees. The, the real, the big issue with record keeping is the concept of rounding time. You know, with hourly employees, they're paid by the hour, right? So you need to be able to track the hours that they're actually working to accurately compensate them for that time. And rounding is really the big issue here, and you see this a lot in litigation. Um, the federal law, and state law for that matter, Wisconsin state law, uh, allows employers to round time. So you don't have to track from, you know, 8.58 to, you know, 2.32 and pay exactly on those minute-to-minute uh, -minute basis. There are ways to round it up so you have nice round numbers, and it becomes a little bit easier 
to track time, and of course to pay time because you have more whole numbers in that regard. However, there are some limitations on this. And what federal law says is that you should really only be rounding to the nearest five minutes, the nearest tenth of an hour, or the nearest 15 minutes. Um, and you really should have a policy in place describing this to employees so they understand what the rounding rules are. And probably most critically is that the rounding cannot be in the employer's favor each time. The idea behind rounding is that, yeah, in some cases the employee is going to be shorted a couple minutes of work. But in other cases, the employer is going to be shorted a couple minutes of work. And so the policy has to be set up so that, in theory, things are kind of go going to be even-steven over time. Whether that actually works out or not is you know, debatable. It's not an exact science, but it has to be at least there in, in theory. So here's an example using a 15-minute rounding policy. And note, this isn't from 8 to 8.15, but it's really seven and a half minutes on each side of the hour. With a 15-minute rounding policy, maybe an employee's start time is normally 9 o'clock. And she shows up and punches in at 8.53, starts her work day right then. Well, you can round that time up to 9 o'clock. So in this example, the employer is actually getting seven minutes of you know, free work in that regard. However, if the next day she comes in and punches in at 9.07, so the other side of the hour, you're going to round that down to 9 o'clock. And so she's getting seven minutes of pay without seven minutes of work. But you can see how it balances out over that two-day period. Um, you, what you couldn't do is have a rounding policy that says it's always going to be rounded up. So the 907 comes 915 and the 853 becomes 9 o'clock. You know, that's something that the Department of Labor would look uh, askance at. Um, there are a few other kind of areas to be careful about. First one's meal breaks. We'll talk about those a little bit later. But if an employee punches out for a lunch break, time should not be rounded. The reason is because you need to have 30 minutes of uh, uninterrupted consecutive time so that a meal break would be excluded from working time. And if you round, it actually might show less than that. And so you have to be careful about it because that could be uh, an issue later. Um, you should really also apply the rounding rules uh, to the start and end time and not just at the end of the day. The, the start and end time, Department of Labor has said that's acceptable. They really haven't talked about other ways to round. So this is just kind of a conservative approach to uh, rounding. One area, too, to be careful of, to be aware of, is if you discipline someone for punching in, say, too early or too late. Um, so in the example above, let's say the worker punches in at 9.07. Well, you know, she's late. She's late to work. Um, and it might be appropriate to issue some sort of discipline for being tardy. You know, maybe your policy even demands it. There are some courts and some attorneys that would argue that invalidates the rounding policy because now employees will never punch in late. They have an incentive always to punch in right on time or early. And so it's no longer going to be balanced out, right? Because they're only going to punch in early. The employer is only going to get the benefit of it. Because if they punch in late, they're going to get disciplined or maybe fired, and they're not going to do that. I'm aware of at least one court that has adopted that rationale. Um, I don't know that it's going to have wider acceptance. But if you do have a disciplinary policy and you do round, just be aware that it's a potential issue, a potential one. OK, so the other kind of administrative part of hourly employees, of course, is calculation of overtime. Um, and there's a few different concepts in here. Many of you who are familiar with this, this is probably just basic for you, but it's, it's worthwhile going over. And overtime is, you know, you know what, what's the concept, right? Everyone knows it's time and a half for hours worked over 40 in a week, right? Very basic. But there are some concepts in there that need to be unpacked because in many circumstances, they, they may make an effect on how you actually calculate overtime. So the first one is what's a work week? And that actually has a technical term. It's 168 consecutive hours, so seven straight days. That's the work week. And the employer can choose what an employee's work week is. You can say it's Sunday to Saturday or it's Wednesday to Tuesday for purposes of calculating overtime and 40 hours and whatnot. But the important thing is that that work week stays fixed for the most part. It's not, you know, it doesn't change in order to deny an employee overtime in any given way, week. And if there is a change, it's for a valid business reason. You could have different work weeks for maybe different departments or different categories of employees. Probably want to stay away from different work weeks based on individual employees, but it has to remain relatively fixed. They don't want to see a lot of tinkering with it. 
And so, okay, so that's the work week. So what's the regular rate? Everyone says time and a half, right? Time and a half. So you make 10 bucks an hour, time and a half is 15, right? Most cases, many cases, yes. But the regular rate is, that, again, a technical term that's different from their hourly rate. And you can see here that includes all compensation subject to certain exceptions. I put up a link here. We're not going to go through the exceptions, but, you know, this link may be helpful to see how the Department of Labor says what's exempt from it. But other compensation besides their hourly rate will oftentimes, maybe even typically, be included in calculating what they are owed for overtime. You can see this in the example. You have an employee who earns $8 per hour, and she worked 45 hours in a week and received a $20 uh, non-discretionary attendance bonus for that week. So non-discretionary bonuses have to be included in the regular rate of pay for that week. So her regular rate is actually $8.44 per hour, and that's arrived at by taking her total hours for the week, multiplied by her hourly rate, get $360. You add in the bonus for $380, and then you divide by the total number of hours worked for that week, $8.44. And that's the rate that's used then to calculate how much she's owed for those five hours of overtime that she worked in that week. Again, it's not a huge difference. It's not a huge amount for this employee in this week. But as we discussed earlier, if, it's, if this calculation is being applied to 100 employees and it's done wrong, and it's done over two or three years, you know, even $5 a week, $10 a week can, can add up quickly. So it's important to understand what should be and shouldn't be included in the calculation of a regular rate, and also to make sure that you have this set up um, so that the work week is the unit that you're measuring. One issue that comes up is, well, you know, I'm, I'm an employer, I pay twice a month. You know, it doesn't neatly break down into work weeks, right, because you might have, you know, you have 15 days, half of a month. Can I just use that as a basis? The answer is no. You can pay on semi-monthly, that's fine, but you still need to have overtime calculated on work week basis. So you might have, you will have work weeks that actually straddle pay periods. And so it, it, it adds a layer of complexity to the accounting work, but it's necessary when you're dealing with hourly employees. Okay, so that's all fine and good, but then how do employers determine what actually needs to be paid? And that's this concept of working time. For hourly employees, for non-exempt employees, they're paid for all hours worked. Again, a technical term under the statute of the regulations. And what that means is all time the employee is suffered or permitted to work. And that definition is key because it doesn't just include time that the employer has authorized someone to work, but suffered or permitted is broader than that. If the employer knows or has reason to know that an employee is doing work off the clock or in an authorized fashion, they have an obligation to pay for that time um, because it's considered hours worked under the statute. Hours worked really is a measure of all kind of principal activity. That's, that's what the employee is meant to do, all their principal activities, and then any activities that are indispensable to those principal activities. So, things, so you can't just say, well, I'm going to pay 8 to 5. That's all I'm going to pay. And if you work starting at 7.30, it doesn't matter. I'm not paying you. No, you got to pay for that time. Now, you can discipline someone for that time, but you still have to account for it and pay for it um, because it's part of their principal job for the employer. It's for the employer's benefit. So let's give a couple examples of this. In, in one case, there was an insurance appraiser um, who, before work, before the start of his official day, would check email, respond to messages, you know, map the route, probably sit in the car, look at paperwork, maybe make some phone call, phone calls, load some equipment. And the question was, was that compensable working time? And the, the court said yes. It's time that needs to be captured and paid for because this is integral and indispensable to his primary job as an insurance appraiser. On the other hand, in this other example, the, the job was stocking shelves and pricing items. And so time that that employee actually was checking email beforehand really wasn't related to this principal job. And so they said, yeah, that's, that's incidental. It's really not something that we consider hours worked. You don't have to pay for it. But it's a highly fact-specific um, uh, analysis. Now, one of the things I say is think about when the FLSA was passed, 1937. You know, what's the first thing that comes to your mind thinking of employment in 1937 besides the Great Depression? I mean, you, you think of factory setting, right? And think of how easy it was or for a supervisor to know when their employees are working. They're on the line. They're, they're literally right in front of you. You can't work at a drill press on the line that's at your house. 
Um, it's much different today. Everyone knows this. Technology has made it much easier, not just for, say, management employees or executive employees to work uh, outside regular hours, but hourly employees with smartphones, with offsite access to email and to documents. And so that poses a challenge because that type, uh, if that's part of their principal activities or incidental to those activities, that needs to be captured and needs uh, to be to be paid for. Again, you can discipline people for working outside of working time when you've told them don't work unauthorized hours. You can even fire people for doing it, but you still have to pay them. It's a little bit backwards. It's a little bit of an odd incentive, but that's what the law says. You can fire them, but you still need to pay them for their time that they've worked. <clears throat> okay, so the concept of working time that has various iterations, various scenarios where it often comes up. So we'll go through a few of those right here. The first is donning and doffing of protective gear. And what the law says is that if protective gear or clothes or any sort of changing is required by law, the rules of the employer or the nature of the work, it needs to be compensated. It's working time. Not only that, but if that time then, if there's time then that's required to say travel from the locker room to the area where they're working, that's compensable time as well. So you might have an employee that you're paying 10 minutes to put on protective gear and another, you know, they have to board a bus to get to their work area, that's another 10 minutes. That's 20 minutes that you're going to have to account for and, and, and pay for that time. Um, one example that came up in the Supreme Court about 10 years ago was uh, people in a, a meat processing plant putting on protective gear that's required by, by, the, by the employer and probably by regulations as well. And that's time that would need to be captured and compensated for. Now the FLSA has an exclusion in it for changing clothes if it's pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement. Time spent changing or washing is not compensable. Wisconsin doesn't have this exception, um, and many states may not. And I know there was a recent Wisconsin Supreme Court case where an employer got in trouble because they thought they were set by the collective bargaining agreement, but they weren't under Wisconsin law. Federal law, they were fine, but not under Wisconsin law. So again, very important to check uh, state law. Another area that's a little bit more complex than this slide makes it seem is on-call time. Employees who are hourly and are expected to be you know, on-call when they're outside of the workplace. And when you're thinking about it, really think about does the employee have the ability to freely use the time that they're technically on call? Um, how much freedom do they have? Are they Do they have to be within a two-mile radius of the employer's business? Because if so, they really can't do their normal daily activities. That time is really spent for the employer. Whereas if, well, while well, they have to take a phone call every now and then and they only have to respond within an hour and you know phone calls don't come in that often, then that time that they're on call is not working time. Sure, if they take the phone call and are on the phone for 15 minutes, they should track it and that's paid. But all the other time they're sitting around waiting, they're able to use it effectively for their own purposes. And so if you have employees that are hourly and that are considered on call, you have to look at this and make sure that what they're doing is actually non-compensable. Um, non -compensable. Travel time is uh, another common area with hourly employees. There's various rules, situations that apply. Um, I don't want to go through all of them, but the general rule is that commuting time is not compensable. But if you start your work day, um, any travel time within your work day is going to be time that needs to be paid for. So, you know, maybe you uh, have a normal office location in Milwaukee and the boss says, well, stop in Waukesha and pick up these papers before you come into Milwaukee. Well, when they stop in Waukesha, that's the start of the work day. And so the time from Waukesha to Milwaukee is traveling time that now needs to be accounted for and paid for. And of course, there are other um, situations as well for overnight or out of town travel. Um, this is another area where it's very important to check state law. Wisconsin has slightly different regulations for overnight travel, and so it might make a difference in the situation. And so, again, it could be a case where you're complying with this for Wisconsin law, but not for federal law. Okay, I mentioned earlier meal and break periods, and I think this is a really important area. I spent just a couple minutes with it, um, because, again, it highlights the differences between federal and state law. Um, in order to say that a meal period is not time worked, it has to be at least 30 minutes long, okay? 30 minutes, which is, again, why it's important not to round meal periods. You need to be able to show it was at least 30 minutes long. But there are some restrictions that you're not allowed to put on. So under federal law, 
the employee must be free to leave the duty post, relieved of all duties, but the employer can require that the employees remain on site. So you meet all those, federal law, 30 minutes, you're fine. But look at state law. It says you must be allowed to leave the premises. So under Wisconsin state law, if an employee, if an employer tells the employee, yeah, you have 30 minutes, but you have to stay here. Yeah, you can leave your desk, but you have to stay on site. Then that's not going to be time that you can exempt from compensable working time. Um, so be careful of that. And one of the things that employers are doing nowadays is actually having automatic deductions for meal periods. They, so you're scheduled, you know, from 8 to 5.30 and they say, well, we're going to deduct a half an hour every day automatically. That's fine. You can do that. But there needs to be a system in place to capture any time the employee doesn't get that 30 minutes where they're told to work through their lunch. Or maybe someone says, you have to stay on site because we might need you in an emergency. So there has to be a mechanism for the employee to report that to an employer so that that automatic deduction can be rescinded for, for the day. Uh, nursing mother breaks is another area to be very careful of. Federal law says that um, nursing mothers um, must be provided with unpaid break time for up to one year after a child's birth in order to express breast milk um, and actually provided with a private area that's not a bathroom and that's shielded from view. Again, it's unpaid time that needs to be provided. However, Wisconsin doesn't have this kind of exemption. And so in a Wisconsin employer has to provide the unpaid time under federal law, but if it's less than 30 minutes long, the break, that's actually time they have to pay for. So federal law says it's unpaid, but Wisconsin law says it's paid. You have to follow state law in that situation. Um, so again, just be, uh, be careful of that if there's any uh, there's nursing mothers in, in the workplace. Final final area is training and meetings. Um, let me give you an example that's maybe not immediately apparent from from this, and that's what they call the overachiever exception. You know, normally in order for training and meetings to be outside compensable time, you have to meet all these. But what the overachiever exception says is, if someone does this on their own and they look for a uh, class that's directly related to the employee's job, but it's outside working time, it's completely voluntary, um, it's because they want to just get better at their job, that's still going to be exempt from working time. And so you don't have to follow that third bullet up there for directly related to the employee's job because it's really on their own. But otherwise, if you have training and meetings, you have to be careful as to whether you're paying them or not because these, these rules, these regulations apply. So just wrap it up real quick with some best practices, and then we'll, we can take. We have a few questions, I think. Um, it's really important, as, as Katie mentioned before, in the context of exempt employees who are now going to be non-exempt, to to train, to have policies in place so that people know what the expectations are and they follow them, and that supervisors, especially, know. Look, just because I didn't authorize someone to work overtime doesn't mean I can say, "Oh, we're not going to pay you for that overtime." They need to understand that because the company and the employer can get in trouble based on a policy that the supervisor may have um, to, to not count time that's actually worked. And again, there, there needs to be greater recognition of off-the-clock electronic access to, to jobs for exempt employees. Ask yourselves, do exempt employees actually need the ability to check email, to look at documents, to make changes when they're not in the office? Maybe, the, maybe it's the case that they do, but if so, there needs to be policies in place to make sure that they're recording their time for doing so. Um, one example, Volkswagen, large employer, they implemented a policy that prevents messages being routed to mobile devices slightly before and after the end of the employee shift, kind of preventing or reducing the temptation to work off the clock. Um, you know, employers, it's a good idea if you have people who are out on unpaid leave to also say, look, they're gone. You know, he's gone. He's on FMLA leave. Don't send him emails. Don't send assignments because that can kind of convert that unpaid time into paid leave. So again, it's always being aware of what time can be considered exempt or non-exempt, or work or compensable or non-compensable. Okay, great. Well, that kind of covers everything. Um, we do have uh, some time for questions. I know one thing that I've had come up before in the past, and Katie kind of touched on it previously, is about the, the election. Can the overtime rules that she discussed uh, be changed? And she kind of addressed the political situation. There are two lawsuits out there challenging those rules. 
Um, one filed by a bunch of state governments and the other by a private business group. Um, my sense is that there's not going to be an injunction issued on them. I could be wrong, but the state government's best bet is really um, like a, a federalism claim, which wouldn't apply to fe uh, private employers. And probably the private group's best argument is that the, the, the regulations unlawfully increase the salary level every three years, but that's not going to affect the salary level that goes into effect on December 1st. So again, everyone should really plan on following them starting December 1st and uh, have, a, have, have something in place then so you're in compliance from the get-go. So we have a few questions from uh, people who are participating with the, through the webinar. The first question is, um, how does the minimum salary requirement apply to those exempt employees who work less than 40 hours per week? There's no exception that would allow you to pay these exempt employees less than 913 per week in order to continue classifying them as exempt. Even if they're working 25 hours per week, they'd still be entitled to that 913 as an exempt employee. However, if they're not working that many hours, it may make sense as to those individuals to convert them to non-exempt and pay them on an hourly basis. Um, kind of going back, I guess, to this uh, overtime changes, are, are nonprofit entities exempt from the FLSA? This is a, kind of a big issue for nonprofits with the raising of the salary level up to $913 per week. The general answer is no. If you, if a nonprofit has revenues of $500,000 per year or more, they're covered by the FLSA. Um, also, if an employee, an individual employee, has job duties that place them in interstate commerce, whatever that means these days, they could individually be covered by the FLSA. Um, that $500,000 level is revenues. It wouldn't necessarily include contributions, charitable contributions. But if the nonprofit has a, a, a gift shop of some sort or they sell merchandise on the internet, that can count. And so nonprofits are going to have to comply with these wage and hour or these overtime changes just as much as a for-profit business in, in most circumstances. And so it's something to look very careful at. Don't assume that, hey, we're a nonprofit, we're, we're outside of the FLSA. Another question that we got, Rob touched on in some of his slides, um, do companies that have payrolls that are semi-monthly still have to pay overtime based on 40 hours per week? Or can they calculate overtime based on that semi-monthly pay period? Um, you would still need to calculate overtime based on a seven-day work week, even if your payroll period is longer than seven days. Right. Yes. yes, question here. Is a sales incentive bonus non-discretionary? And if a salesperson doesn't meet their goal, do we have to pay the bonus anyway to make sure they remain the same? So you'd want to first check and see whether they might qualify for one of the exemptions where um, they don't have to meet that minimum 913 per week. It's possible as a salesperson that they wouldn't uh, have to be paid that minimum salary each week. Um, but to your question, which is what happens if we have a non-discretionary bonus and the individual doesn't meet the targets necessary? Do I still have to pay them the bonus in order to continue classifying them as exempt? Um, and the answer is yes, if they um, haven't been paid 913 per week uh, because you were assuming they would receive 10% um, through this other bonus, then you'd have to find um, another way to get them to 913, whether you created a different bonus policy, um, but there's no exception built in for that circumstance that you described. So that can be done quarterly, right? Can't can you make a quarterly catch-up? Correct, at least quarterly, yes. Yeah, more often than that. And the quarter is set by the employer. Same thing, you don't want to be messing around with it in order to avoid it. But yeah, if you set it in advance, it's fine. Yes? I have a question on uh, not unpaid interns. Um, you give the definition of paying a what that you're asking. Yeah. So there has to be educational credit given 
case that uh, sure. is, there, is that a requirement not to pay that in order not to yeah. pay? So the question is for unpaid interns, does the individual have to be receiving educational credit in order to be correctly classified as an unpaid intern? And the answer is no. There's no requirement that they receive any kind of educational credit for it. Um, however, again, it should be similar to training they would receive in an educational setting. Okay, well great. Thank you very much everyone. Uh, we have a short break now.